to have a strong opinion on the future and have in mind that you know climate change is real <laughs> So it's not like that we have much of a chance that we can just experiment and like, yeah, let's see what 2035 brings us. No, I mean, this future has to be sustainable. It has to be, you know, the Kreta generation. It has to be adopted by Gen Z. And then have a very educated guess like, okay, this is what I want to grow up to and then work backwards. And like, if, if that means my future as a company or as an individual, I can do that next year, next month, tomorrow, to go at least the first step into that direction. Max Giordano is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Max is a good friend of mine. We've known each other for a while uh, through Kitternet and some other areas we'll kind of touch upon later in the show, but Max is a digital strategist and creative with a 25 plus year track record in innovative digital projects. Max started his career in the digital stone age, ID Media, uh, Aktengesellschaft in the mid nineties and was involved in numerous internationally awarded digital projects like Volkswagen's digital launch campaign for the new Beetle, launch of Wallpaper Magazine Online, Sony Europe, and Swatch. He played a vital role establishing Psycosmos, the leading social network in the UK and Germany at the time. He is truly a digital, innovative, futurist rock star. In 2000, Max joined Meta Design AG's management board and was in charge of the digital unit at Meadow Design and he was involved in Europe's first mobile projects for clients like NTT, Docomo's, iMode and Telefonica. Yes, there were mobile projects in 2001 and Max became an evangelist for mobile services many moons before the iPhone was launched. His early passion for mobile led to him becoming the co-founder and managing par partner of Icon Mobile in 2003, which was one of the first mobile-centric agencies worldwide. Max helped to grow the company from four founders to more than 200 employees with offices in Berlin, Tokyo, Sydney, London, and New York. As a product lead, Max was responsible for one of the first mobile servers in 2004 and developed mobile marketing and advertising formats for the likes of MSN, O2, and Yahoo. Basically, he has worked with the iconic companies of our world, Apple, T-Mobile, Orange, um, and he was with one of the world's largest agency networks and was invited to join ProSieben, which is a European uh, German satellite one digital as a member of the management board. He was in charge of mobile games and innovations for them as one of Europe's leading media companies at the time. He's launched ISO apps and numerous other things. I could go on and on because he's been around for a while. And any of those of you who are my listeners who have seen or heard him speak before, whether that's at DLD or for Mercedes or MTV or Universal Music, he has been involved with projects from Lady Gaga and 50 Cents, video offerings, and on and on. Lego, Apple, Lufthansa, Volkswagen, Daimler. I hope you're getting the picture. Red Bull, Deutschland, Telekom. So the guru, the rock star, is sitting across from me. He's oh. getting red. Yeah. Welcome I'm... to the show, Max. I, I appreciate it. Thanks goodness I, I, I condensed that 36-page biography down to a couple of paragraphs, but I'm so glad to have you here, brother. <laughs> Thanks, to the Mark. Show. You're... Thanks, Mark. Was, was that the longest introduction you ever had to do? <laughs> no, I've had some scientists on with much oh. longer longer. Uh, uh, some 70 plus year old uh, scientists and biologists on, and they have a huge, huge list of <laughs> accolades and accreditations. 
Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I should have wrapped it up in like, in like three sentences. But uh, yeah, you just made me feel very old. Uh, I think the, the matter of fact that it's a long list is that I'm simply working since 25 years in, in digital innovation. And over the years, you just, uh, you know, have all these clients and all these different relationships. So that's just why the list is so long. But in a nutshell, I would consider myself a creative strategist and I'm really passionate about co-creating futures together with clients. So that's the, that's the very short form who I am. And you do a fabulous job at that. Everybody who knows you, everybody who's worked with you is uh, ecstatic and very excited to, to get your not only drive wisdom and your knowledge and, and your insight to help them move forward in, in these digital transitions and, and getting into the future. We um, uh, first met live um, at one of the MLove events for Harold Neidhart and then yeah. at Kinternet in Avalon in France, um, which was a fabulous event. And I've heard you speak numerous times since. We're on the faculty and one of founding members of Future IO Institute and kind of advise and do, do many things together. I'm so blessed to have received your wisdom and your help over the years where you come mark your your presentation's too long you've got too many slides cut it down please make it shorter you know give us the give us the short version and what what you didn't know is that i was just taking a page out of your book because i've seen your presentations you you know the 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 the, the movie fast and furious yeah. If you've ever seen one of Mac's presentations, you'll know what I mean. He, he lets you drink from the fire hose of the future of where we're going and how things are working and how the youth and Gen Z of, of our world will mm. be working and living in the future. And so I really thank you for, for that. And uh, I think our brain works alike in many uh, ways like that. We're kind of systems thinkers and think in complexities and really try to push these models out to the boundary of the future. Uh, my first question for you really is, um, how have you weathered this pandemic since I, I last saw you and all these years of experience that you've had in innovation and future and these transformations, has any of that helped you prepare or, or weather this pandemic a little bit better or how, how have you been? Catch us up to speed. Yeah, I mean, I will, I mean, first of all, thanks, you've been too kind to, no, no, no. <laughs> to mention all these things. And, and by, by the way, I highly appreciate your input and your talks. And um, I've seen you a couple of times. And for me, it was really astonishing to see the progress from, you know, the first time I saw you, I, it was pure horror for me, like, damn, we are screwed. Like, you know, we are, and I mean that in a positive way, what you ended up with me is like this notion of we have to change. <laughs> so that was really, really there. And then over time, how you, um, you know, how it evolved towards like, look, and here are some strategies. And what I will never forget is when you say stuff like, um, even if we slow down, we go into the wrong direction. <laughs> And that made me think like, yeah, actually he's right. I mean, it's a complete turnover that is needed, not just slowing down. So I just wanted to, to um, thank you again for, for having me appreciate it. And in, in respect of your question, was I prepared? Yes and no. I mean, as you know, our lifestyles and you mentioned Kinonet and I think it's like, a, you know, if you take future IO, Kinonet, I would even say Burning Man, like all these tribes, I mean, they're somehow connected. Most of us, of course, are totally used to work as digital nomads. Um, so we are used to working anywhere where there is an internet connection with our laptops. Um, we are used to work in agile environments and in teams. I mean, as a matter of fact, I had projects where you have 10, 15 different people and you never see each other and they're coming from all over. So that is a pretty good preparation for a lockdown. Also, if you work in an agile environment, if you do your, your daily standups and your routines and you have all the software in place. So yes, that came as a, as a big preparation. However, I have to say, um, I think yeah, most of us have been surprised how, how fast it goes. And on a 
psychological level, I mean, there's this amazing um, podcast from Tim Hartford, um, Cautionary Tales. I can highly recommend it um, because he spent, I think, at least six episodes very thoughtfully around, you know, not only COVID, but going back to history, like um, Hurricane Katrina, I mean, New Orleans, I mean, they were aware <laughs> that, um, you know, a hurricane is a real threat to New Orleans. They knew it, they had a minor one before, and yet they didn't see it coming. They didn't prepare, nothing was in place. And so he goes back to history, I mean, even to, you know, influenza and how we dealt with with the pest in the in the mid century and, and stuff like that. So it's in the middle age. So it's really interesting to see somehow we know things and then something in our psychology is is holding us back to do probably very traumatic steps. So I mean, to fast forward 2020, as you know, with Kinnernet, I mean, we've discussed it super early. I mean, as soon as there was something happening in China, our kidnet chats, you know, they exploded like, oh, this is serious. This is not the influenza. This is far more serious. This will have a major impact. And you're part of this conversation and still you're booking yourself a ticket to South by Southwest. <laughs> um, you know, because somehow it's like, yeah, you know, it's China and let's see, and maybe in March and, and then it's just like, you know, what we experienced with these exponential developments. And, and for me, it's a perfect metaphor. Yeah, one, two, four, eight, 16, these exponential steps, you hear about it in China, you, you read about it. It's like, oh, okay, hmm, that's okay. We have to take that seriously. But then it's 16, 32, 64, um, Mobile World Conference canceled in Barcelona. Oh, wow, this is serious. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, and then it, it just hit me um, with this exponential curve like everyone else. But as I've said, because of my work was already vastly remote and I'm used to work in these agile environments and with these standups, for me, it was relatively easy to cope with that. Um, and now I'm just improvising like anyone else, like uh, so uh, from from less physical meetings to all these Zoom calls and, and Microsoft Teams calls from, you know, offline events where you do uh, corporate workshops and co-creation design thinking more to online collaborative stuff. So you've, yeah. you've brought out some wonderful tools or helped uh, people uh, during this time with some different tools and some abilities to um, uh, continue business, continue meetings, to have some digital tools and services as well that I really appreciate and, and like. But ha have uh, ha have you realized that you're getting more, you've gotten more busy during this time, that you're actually working more than usual? And, and, and that's one question. And the other question really is, um, are, are you liking this kind of a transition to even more these digital tools or are you are you thinking that you're watching the hollywood squares or the muppet show you know with the all the little yeah. the, the all the little boxes or, or you know uh, is there any insights in that what what um you're easing into or, or or can you give us maybe some foresight of some new things that might be emerging or that we could expect out of this as well yeah yeah it it it, it comes in various flavors i i do have to say and I read it the other day. There is this amazing study um, when in London was uh, there was a tube strike, I think like 10, 15 years ago. And as you know, I mean, everyone in London commutes to work with, with, with the tubes and the buses and etc. So there was this major strike and people have been forced out of the blue <laughs> to completely rechange their routes. Like instead of going, you know, this one, whatever, Piccadilly line and change ones, all of a sudden you have to change twice, you need to take a bus or walk. But my point is with the study, what was for me, it really blew my mind is that after the strike, you know, like 15% roughly stuck with this new route. So it basically tells you like, look, for years you're taking the same paths and then something happens, uh, like an outside event happens. And then you realize, wait a second, not everything is bad. Actually, changing here means, you know, maybe I take a bus and I see more or maybe I can do grocery shopping or maybe I walk and it's a little bit of a workout or, 
you know, maybe this scene, this, this route is way more scenery or whatever. <laughs> so 15% um, were forced, like of those who were forced said like, oh, the new thing, the new normal isn't that bad. And so for me, it's, it's a perfect metaphor for what we're experiencing right now. I mean, take these typical business meetings like, hey, Mark, can you come to Berlin Friday, three o'clock? It's really important. You have to meet this guy, that guy. Uh, let's have a, you know, a really cool meeting for an hour and you take the train or <laughs> you take the plane from Munich. We've all had that. And I think this is, this is gone and that's for the better. So this is exactly these 15% London tube strike where you realize, wait a second, just to get to know someone, um, to have a status meeting, to discuss a project, I can do that remotely really well. So I think that's the positive side, less travel, less business travel, more focused meetings, you know, meetings where you need to be prepared and it's clear who's doing what afterwards. And so I think that's something on, on, on the positive side. And uh, your first question was like, yeah, do I feel stressed out and, and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's like almost like a sinus curve, like a pendulum. Once the world went full remote work from home, like yourself, like everyone, we've just been in all these calls throughout the day. <laughs> And basically we felt then like, wait a second, it can't be that it's afternoon. I haven't had breakfast. I'm still in my pajama. <laughs> I haven't even been to the mailbox. I, and yeah, and I think now, if you ask me personally, I think I found now a good mixture. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very strict with timing. So, you know, if we say like, let's have this call and it's between five people. And if it's for an hour, it should really end at an hour. Um, I'm taking my breaks. So, you know, I need to be off the camera. Um, uh, I need this work-life balance. So like, even if it means going for yoga or sports or for a walk with the dog during the daytime, <laughs> um, it also means like, you know, switching off video. I think that's somehow really interesting that most who are now so used to video like you know I, I you know taking the example of our friend harald with future io i know him inside out he's a great friend if we have a proper business call i don't need to see him <laughs> i can do it you know Just on my telephone. phone yeah yeah what's the big advantage and, and people tend to forget that uh you know i can stand up i can go to the garden i can take the dog and still be present with harald and have a a meaningful conversation but without being stuck to you know this the screen and so so those are some yeah so so in a nutshell um i'm 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 doing good i realized stuff that is you know i'm, I'm we shouldn't say that's positive about this pandemic because of course it's it's horrible and it's a tragedy but you know from a work perspective me personally some things are changed for the better less bis travel you know you know more opportunities to work internationally i mean if if you do an online event you can ask speakers who you would never ever be able to fly in you have them now on a zoom call or or you know on a video call um and I think, you know, with the, in German, we say Entschleunigung, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. in English, the, you know, taking the break, I think that's what, yeah. you know, like, like a full break, this is what actually the planet and us probably also needed, uh, it makes you reflect on what's really important. And, you know, what's what's not so necessary, what what do you miss about travel? So for me, I'm also very reflective. Um, I've mentioned the business meetings. I mean, I don't miss them at all to, you know, to, to go there for an hour meeting. I do miss travel, travel, like going to Kinonet in France and meeting new friends and meeting old friends. So you start like me, I started to realize, you know, what I really, really miss, what I, what I can compensate with virtual stuff, um, what I can't wait to, to go back to. It's a very, I think it's a very, uh, yeah, it's a very good Buddhistic uh, exercise, actually. 
Thanks for giving us the update and letting my listeners know this insight. And, and you you can decide this. I don't want to reveal too much of your personal, but you you are pretty disciplined and have a routine as far as your yoga and supplements and, and doing a little exercise and getting out and you know, walking your dog and, and, and things like that, um, that, that I think is really interesting as, as far as that discipline and routines during a t- time like this, that you find a new way to, to build them in are so, so vital because it can, it can really, really change. Uh, um, if, if you give those up now that you're working solely from home or digitally, that uh, you don't get that me time to, to recharge and, and to do that. But are there any of those things you'd like to share with us that have really been a help for you or that you've realized this, boy, I thank, thankfully I was doing those before and they've really helped me even get through this time better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's not only about me. I think the, you know, the biggest misconceptions about creative people, and I would consider myself a creative person, you know, I, I'm really not good in Excel. <laughs> I mean, I get, you know, you don't want me to work on Excel and I'm, I'm not the best project lead you can imagine. I'm, I'm really good in strategy and in creative work and people with this creative yeah, environment, you know, the biggest misconception is that people like myself are totally chaotic. So, you know, when people see my, my desk uh, in, a, in a work environment, um, you know, they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm the cliche. It's, it's totally chaotic. <laughs> it's... Uh, you know, and, and if I work creatively with a client, I mean, this energy sparks fly and like, oh, how about this? And we can do that. And why don't we do a pop-up location and we do old shipping containers and we remodel them and we do this. Expo- oh, oh. So people usually think that I'm super chaotic, but as a matter of fact, um, I'm way more disciplined than people uh, imagine because for me, First of all, it helps to manage the chaos. Um, and second, um, you know, it helps you to prioritize. So I have, I have fairly, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite strict. I mean, it starts with getting up early. That was never a problem for me in my entire life. Like I never, you know, I was never the schoolboy who, oh, it's six o'clock. I mean, I always was an early riser. Mm-hmm. And the older I get, the less sleep I need for the biological reasons. And usually I'm up around like four or five the latest. So I start my day um, really early and I, I like that. The world, you know, sleeps, <laughs> you don't get emails, you, do, you, you definitely don't get phone calls. And for me, it's a, it's a slow way to start. You know, I, I would hate the feeling like, oh, alarm clock. First of all, I never, I never need an alarm clock, even if I have a super early morning. You know, if I go to bed and I know I have to wake up for whatever reasons, I will wake up. (laughs) Compare that to an alarm clock. Oh, damn, it's 8.30. Uh, I need to be in this meeting. I mean, I don't want to start stress. So I'm taking my time in the morning. Um, I'm still practicing my meditation. And I think it will take me another 20 years to master that. I'm horrible uh, on that. But, you know, again, technology helps. So I don't know if I have it here somewhere yeah you know the the muse headband yeah, um, yeah. It, it's it, it really helps me to uh, you know to be more focused I'm, I'm using apps like headspace and calm so i'm meditation really became a huge part of my morning like huge not in length <laughs> because i'm still practicing and still for me 15 minutes of meditation is 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 a horrible experience (laughs) but it takes a you know no matter even if i have a super early train or flight i'll take these 10 15 minutes um um, yoga because in my age if i don't do something around the body you know the back aches and the knee (laughs) aches um and yeah like to have these these uh, you know really these breaks like for walking the dog or doing sports have become really, really important. And then just to finish on this, these, these little hacks, um, like I've said, I'm super disciplined and in work, you know, then there I'm like really like a machine, like 
I love these Pomodoro techniques, for instance, where you focus 20 minutes on something. So <laughs> I said that in, in the past often to colleagues, if I, you know, if I'm working concentrated on something and I need something from a colleague, and if I write her on Slack, for instance, I never expect immediately a response. For me, it's scary. It's super scary if people, you, you know that feeling, you write someone on Slack and then 20 seconds later, you have the answer. And I'm like, dude, yeah. you should, you know, there's no three in the morning, you should be sleeping or you know, it's exactly. lunchtime, whatever. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so many times I had to tell colleagues like, look, if I'm up at 6 a.m. and if I'm writing you an email, it doesn't mean you need to reply before you had breakfast. I don't expect the answer right away. If I write you on Slack and, you know, if it would be urgent, I would say so. But, you know, you, you know what I mean. So yeah, I'm taking yeah. really like I'm really focused. So if I'm 20 minutes, you know, on LinkedIn, you know, getting some inspiration, maybe answering some some incoming uh, uh, mails, whatever. It's 20 minutes of LinkedIn and you can't call me. I will not check emails. I mean, nothing will disturb me from those 20 minutes. And then after that, I'll take a, you know, a two, three minute break. And then I do 20 minutes of emails. And in that time, again, nothing can, 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 can disturb me. And I have my phone, phone calls scheduled out. So in those 20 minutes doing calls, I mean, I'm not checking emails. So um, working focused, like really having like these little hacks. And you mentioned with last but not least, you mentioned with the body stuff, with the food and the nutrition. Yeah. I mean, the older I get, the more important it gets. I mean, we all started young and, you know, like the 16 hours days and like junk food. And the older you get, you realize like, wait a second, after an Italian lunch break and the big pasta I'm dead. I can sleep for an hour. I, I can't work. So hmm, maybe it's something with the pasta. <laughs> uh, and then you realize the, you know, how, how food, how, how different it is, um, what you consume, um, even down to an health aspect, like staying healthy, like, you know, what, what food makes you really survive the, the, the influenza season, what, what food makes you like recover faster? Uh, what sort of food is actually good for you and which not? So yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it, it became exciting. It, be, it, it became a favorite topic of mine, a passion project, yeah. We, we've never talked about this, uh, um, the, the food and the health aspect, but in a lot of respects, we're, we're very similar. I, I also get up extremely early. It's probably from my farming family background somehow but i also don't use an alarm clock it's just a normal uh a rhythm of how i sleep and uh, i just can get up um there's no real big trick as i get older the only trick is as i usually have to go to the bathroom early in the morning and so that's an, a beautiful alarm clock to know that it's time to get up and stay up i don't go back to bed afterwards but that's part of getting old um, and then I, I really see that, that as well, like, like you mentioned, the discipline is important. A lot of people find it scary. They say, oh, discipline could be a little bit scary. It's actually not. It's freedom. The yeah. more disciplined you are, uh, the more freedom you have, the more time you have in the day, the more accomplishments you get during the day. And you don't feel depressed because you didn't get something done or that you're behind or you're late if you have that. Uh, boy, the world is it's, uh, so much freedom, but it's also just this fabulous feeling throughout the day. And um, I, uh, years ago, I, I was a, became a coach through Rhonda Britton's Fearless Living Coach. And that was one of the things that uh, I would been living before, but I really didn't get the understanding of why that is, uh, being disciplined, having routines and, and, and you know, overcoming, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of time for things that maybe you don't want to do that if you get in a minute or to five minutes of it then then you forget about the pain of starting a project or doing something and then you get into this flow state and 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 uh you know so i really appreciate those those things and hopefully we'll have some other tips throughout our discussion that people can use and apply and and, and use as takeaways but 
Uh, I've always seen that and I, I really appreciate it. One other thing that you mentioned is, um, you know, not only digital nomad and kind of, you do a lot of, on this uh, humans of new work, the future of work, you know, working things as well, or you've touched upon it over the years. Uh, we do a lot with future and foresight and also um, moonshot thinking, moonshot innovations, innovations of the future. But, but real, the, the, the thing that I see, and maybe you have uh, something that you could, you could speak on in this, is that it's really similar to me, like NASA, like the European Space Agency, like Russia for the Sputnik rocket. They've been launching rockets in Russia from the same historical spot for decades now. And uh, if you look at any of their mission control centers, it's not just that one mission control, it's controls in, in Houston and, and, and California and in Russia and in Hawaii and different places around the world that people are digitally video or audio communicating with themselves and doing works, but it's also the preparation up to that launch time, up to the project completion, where they're not always traveling to those places to get things done, that there's a lot of this digital collaboration. And, and this year during the pandemic, you know, we had the fabulous uh, Falcon crew uh, get up to the uh, uh, ISS space station and the difference from the cockpit of, of you know, the old shuttle and Apollo cockpits and all the panels and buttons. And then you see the new Falcon X uh, crew uh, dragon cockpit and there's like 12 buttons and three touch screens, you know, that transition, that digital transition, but also ways of doing things autonomously working and doing this, you know, this different type of work is just, something that I've, I've, I've seen over the years that is very similar to the space industry. It's also very similar to the way the United Nations works in, in a lot of respects, especially now during the pandemic, they're, everything's online and digital. Um, but in some respects, that, you know, we, we need to make that transition like uh, SpaceX did from this analog system to kind of a better, more effective uh, functioning system. And, and I don't know if you've realized that or seen those connections or similarities or talk about them at all in, in your work. Yeah. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is because you're referring to moonshots and I'm, I'm pretty sure you mentioned it a couple of times with, with the famous JFK talk in, in 61, where we will put the man on the moon and bring uh, it safely back and in this decade and do the other things, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this talk, I think that's one of the most inspiring. It's a very short talk and who, you know, it's it's really worthwhile going back on YouTube and, and watch it. It's just like a few minutes that I think that are super relevant. And in there, he says, um, we do it not because they're easy, because but because they are hard. <laughs> and because they are hard, they help us to, to be better organized. <laughs> And, you know, for me, that's, that's always so interesting to see. For me, COVID, the, you know, the pandemic, it's almost like a searchlight. It's a radar on things that are not going so well. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's almost like a, an outside event that helps you to realize, hmm, our IT infrastructure is not that modern. I mean, we say people work from home, but they can't access their emails so <laughs> there's a problem so yeah. the searchlight says like oh you have to change something um you know whether you had agile methodologies in place i mean is your team working agile and if do you have for instance a daily stand-up or not um do you have like a like in product management how you do your things so i think we currently, all of us, no matter which industry, really no matter which industries, we have the big searchlight now in our organizations and we immediately immediately realize, okay, we should invest in something like Slack, Microsoft Teams. Oh, we, we, need, to, we need to get some agile coaches in. We need to change the way we are building products. Um, but also resilient leaderships, you know, you realize, and I've seen within my client base and my partners, the entire range from being a super scared, 
you know, like turmoil, chaotic, like, ah, uh, you know, like literally being completely shocked in, in how you call it, like being static, you know, like the, the rabbit before the snake, the entire range to the type of leadership that is, you know, you know what, this is a challenge we will overcome. <laughs> like Churchill said, every, every, you know, don't let the good crisis go to waste. There is a chance for us. And you start to do weekly town halls with everyone. You start to have virtual coffee breaks with, with, uh, corp, uh, with, with colleagues. You start to think like, oh, maybe I should send something to the team. Um, oh, we should do a virtual event, we should do a party, uh, we should do X, Y, Z. So, you know, I think it brings out the best and the worst of us. And in respect of your question, yeah, we, we are now forced to, to go these hard ways. And as K uh, JFK said, it is a good exercise because, because it's so hard, it's, um, it forces us to think outside the box. It forces us to reconsider Oh, we've been doing it 20 years. Why change? And now, you know, you're forced. You know, very, very, very simple example. Um, I worked with, um, you know, uh, within one segment with the sales department and their way to do sales was like, oh, we're doing it since 20 years. It's the same. We go there, you know, we show the product. We have a nice conversation. We leave the sample. We leave the leaflet. I mean, that's how sales does forget about digital and i'm like okay but <laughs> wouldn't it be you know couldn't be digital i mean with an ipad app or maybe like a, a b2b website i mean couldn't we do more and blah? no we don't need it and now you have a lockdown and now you have the same people not able to go physically somewhere and it's yeah this is then the hard way like okay wait a second hmm yes we need something so the searchlight is on <laughs> We need to digitize sales. We need to come up with new solution and fast. We need that in a few weeks because we have zero sales, like zero sales from the one day to the other because we can't go physically somewhere. Problem. That's a huge problem. And that's a big wake up call as well. And yeah. we've, we've seen that, um, that those reactionary companies that don't have something, whether it's a digital transformation or the, sustainable future built into their business model somehow are really struggling and having a difficult time during this time of the pandemic, but also Black Lives Matters, Be Beirut, um, the Hurricane Laura, and, and uh, you know, which is just the aftermath of Katrina, basically, it's the new Louisiana hurricane, um, that they're just not prepared because they don't have a resilient business model, they don't have anything digital. So there's no infrastructure there to to help them in a form of crisis. And uh, it's always about cost and money and it's difficult to do and, and that we've done it this way. So why should we change? We need to stop waiting for the future be, to be delivered to us. We need to actually be a, a little bit uh, and not be reactionary. We should be uh, preventative. We should be have foresight to have those infrastructures in place because actually, even in times where everything's going good, it's a better business model, it brings better returns, the, uh, the investments are better, it, it's really a better model. And, and so that uh, this, this way, well, we're not going to evolve, we're not going to change that way of thinking is just uh, out, outdated. And yeah, it, it, it is hard. Sometimes that transition is hard, but it's so necessary. So I really uh, appreciate you bringing that up. This year started out as, uh, for, in my opinion, as an absolute bang. It was going fabulous. We yeah. last like saw each everyone, other. For yeah, everyone. for everyone. The decade of action, you know, everything, everything was coming into place and, and so much momentum. We saw each other. But we saw each other at D. But we saw each other at DLD yeah, in Munich. It was awesome. And, it was awesome. It was the most fabulous thing. But just things were just at an exponential pace, some commitments, some things were going. It was just fabulous. And then this thing just took the wind out of our sails, you know, the pandemic. Um, I, I really, you know, now it's we're back into this very hard nationalism, uh, very hard division and that. And so my real big first question for you to kind of to to lead into transition to the other things I want to talk about is 
with all this division, with all this nationalism, with all these borders and walls and people fighting against each other, with the pandemic, social distancing and mask and et cetera, how would you feel about the total opposite? Are you a global citizen? How would you feel about being a global citizen? What would uh, you think about a world without nations, divisions, borders, walls, or divisions of humanity? Um, uh, what are your thoughts and feelings on that? And how can we not get back to business as usual or to the new normal, but how can we do a great reset and actually catapult us into the future where we need to be with the digital transformations and all the things that we've been talking about today, but we've been doing for years? Um, I mean, thank you for, for bringing that up. I mean, those are major <laughs> topics and maybe I need to you know, divide it into two, three different points. I mean, the first thing, and I, the first thing you mentioned, and I'm so glad you brought it up, is this: you know, why are people not moving? Why are they static? Why are they not innovating? And I think part of that answer is because it went too well. <laughs> you know, if you're, you know, I'm, I'm as you can tell by my funny German accent, I'm German. You know, the, you know, our favorite industry is probably the automotive industry. If you're having record sales. You know, Volkswagen, 11 million cars last year. If you're in such a position, everything is cool. You're selling 6 million cars in China, 11 million cars, cars all over. You're printing money. <laughs> so there is no immediate rush for, for innovation. Yes, Tesla is around since years. And yes, you know it. They, they, all of, you know... I think one big misconception is that often people think like corporates are stupid, like, ah, oh, Volkswagen hasn't seen it coming. Or why is whoever X, Y, Z, why are they not reacting to Netflix or name any industry? It's, it's a, a big misconception. No, they have good trend scouting. They are aware of these developments. But if you're listed on the stock market, if you are bringing, you know, every three months, you have to report your numbers if you're doing really good, like record numbers in sales, it's super hard to do dramatic changes and in innovations. I mean, how would you argue that towards the stock market shareholders, even to employees like, oh, wait, we're building up, we are going full into electric, whatever. <laughs> you know, forget about that. We just sold 11 million combustion engines. You know what I mean? So yeah. part number one, what I realized is um, innovation, like one of the, the, the biggest things that hold us back is if things are going really well. If, if you have record numbers, it's hard to be innovative. Um, once you have a burning platform, so media industries 10 years ago, because the threat was imminent, YouTube, Netflix, Spotify, whatever came, Google, whatever comes up, it's an immediate threat of your core business model. You have to, to, to react. But with other industries, with the food, the pharmaceutical, automotive, but now changing to, to the second part, what you mentioned with the pandemic, now the threat became a real one and it became a global one. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, there is like everyone notices it. I mean, from everything around transportation, logistic, tourism, but then all these ripple effects was, was like super fascinating. I mean, for instance, very, very stupid example. If there is no sports, many, many media outlets can't report about sports. So they don't have page impressions. So the advertising drops from a lot to almost zero just because there are not people playing in the stadium and you can't report about it. I mean, you know better than I do with all the, the logistic chains with, you know, with the oil stuck somewhere on some tanker because you don't know where to put it because people are not driving. And so now I'm coming to your big question around global citizenship. I mean, absolutely. I think every one of us experienced that. Um, every one of us experienced it. We're in this together. You know, um, for me, it's like painfully to think about, you know, I think in Germany, we have an amazing system with all the loans and with all, I mean, with our health system and everything. But, you know, often I have to think about these individuals I met. I mean, you have the world map behind you, but 
you know, it starts with I'm, I'm often in Spain and I think of these really little retail stores that I go to the, you know, the little tapas place, the yeah, little yeah. Japanese noodle place. And I'm like, oh, they suffer currently. I don't know if they ever will recover. My sister lives in Japan and I'm trying to be there like once a year. And I love Tokyo and, you know, all these little tea shops and these little clothes shops like and i'm like ah they they will suffer and and then you know don't talk about india brazil you know these 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 countries so dependent on tourism to cut the long story short um the way i was i was raised i'm you know i'm not exaggerating i'm like super low uh, working class like my father was an untrained factory worker um he didn't have any education because of World War II. My mother was a, a hair cutter, so I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I'm really grew up super modest. Um, but one very important life lesson that I learned as a kid was, you know, for my parents, and I'm I grew up at the south of Germany, like a tiny village, like you know, three thousand people. For for my parents, people were the same. So I never experienced pre-judges, pre-judges, you know, I never experienced my parents like, why is this woman wearing, you know, a, a scarf, burka. Yeah. a burka, yeah. or oh, look at the, the foreigner, you know, I never experienced that in the way I was brought up, because for this generation of my parents, it probably was that after the war, war it was pure survival, and it was just like getting food on the table, and you do that by doing honest work and, you know, have a high moral compass and, you know, not screwing over others. And so I was raised that way. So I never, you know, I never felt estranged to different color of skin or different religions. And somehow I'm, I'm in my late 40s now, you know, as stupid as it sounds, I always had it like you can be you can believe in Jedi religion, you can be a Buddhist, you can be Muslim. For me, it's, you know, all good, as long as you're not behaving like an asshole to others. <laughs> I'm super tolerant, but please show that tolerant yourself. <laughs> um, I, I don't care about the color of skin, you can be green, blue, black, because we're all people. And it's the same with language. And one very, very you know, biography, I just told you how, how I was raised, I think for me from the biography, often I ask myself, like, why do I light up if I'm traveling? Why do I feel so energetic meeting new friends at Kinnonet or at Burning Man? Probably it's because that my parents never left this little town. You know, my father was 40 years in the same job at the factory pushing, you know, buttons at really as a factory worker. So for me, if Stan calls and says like, hey, can you come to Tallinn and work with me, uh, you know, and do a co-creation, innovation, whatever. And like, Tallinn, sure. And then I'm soaking it up like, uh, you know, for me, it's almost like a vacuum. I've never been to Tallinn. I want to know all about the politics, the food, the culture. I mean, it's almost, I'm, I'm almost obsessed with Wikipedia. So, you know, I'm going in through Tallinn with Wikipedia and I read up history and then, you know, people like Stan that you also know so dearly, I'm, I'm, you know, having conversations about his grandparents. And for me, it's like, wow. And then, you know, I really, I'm, I'm super grateful for having that opportunity because I know that I'm blessed on that. You know, I'm, I'm not making millions with my work, but, you know, for having a good day rate, having interesting jobs and the opportunity to see the world, I mean, that's how much more of a reward you want to get. Um, learn about cultures, learn about other people um, and hopefully leave, you know, hopefully leave something behind, whether it's in, you know, in a business sense, whether it's an interesting innovation project or as a human being, whether it's by influencing people to do maybe a little change. I think that that is uh, so beautiful the way you you describe that. What I what I've experienced, you might have experienced this over the years, is that 
Um, I, I did hundreds of events every, every single year and the events like uh, Kinternet, events like DLD, events like uh, Thailand Management Association or Sustainable Brands, um, trying to think of some other ones. When, when you travel to those locations, it's, it, yeah, it's an event and it's an unconference and, and you speak and, and you do uh, different things. So it's kind of a work thing, but you get to meet the people, you get to exchange with them. You, you, uh, it's not 17 or a hundred speakers on 17 stages at the same time, all competing for your ear. And, um, there, you know, then the expo and everybody's trying to sell you and give you a business card, but that you get to see the culture, you get to see the place, you get to meet the people, have in-depth uh, uh, conversations and eat with them and explore the place that you're at. That's what I really love. But what I realized is the majority of those events that I went to, very superficial, very shallow. I get to see the airport, the taxi, the hotel, go to the event, get done speaking, get leave, don't have time to engage with anybody really. And it's just seems so empty. And then you have to, well, okay, well, we had 20,000 people or we had 70,000 if it's, you know, if it's a world mobile conference, if it's four years from now, whatever it is, uh, 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 that is, that is not where we need to be. We need to be into a place where we're actually having meaningful exchanges with people where we're getting something to see that we're all connected on this planet as, as global citizens, that we can all benefit from knowledge and wisdom from each other and, and kind of have an exchange and dialogue to see that I, I really like that. And that's, uh, you know, you probably experienced that as well, um, that, I guess the, the last thing of that is with this uh, global citizen, I, I, I've heard that in the digital space, the internet and, and uh, digital arenas, I've heard talk of diplomatic delegates or, or uh, um, digital diplomats, uh, you know, different countries are thinking about creating special positions just for the internet, for the digital realm. Um, uh, kind of a, because there are some things that are global citizens. Food is a global citizen. The, the internet was meant to be for everyone. It was the digital rescue of a new kind of an operating system. Open source hasn't become that way. I mean, the ICANN, I guess, is the digital ruler of the internet now to some extent. Uh, but, but there's got to be, you know, uh, species, animals, birds, they don't find borders. The pandemic is a global citizen. It, it's the air, the water, the way it moves around our world. So why can't we be global citizens? Why can't we kind of move into some kind of, or have a, a global operating space that we can function and say, you know, this is the standard. We're all equal. We can all exchange somehow. I don't know if you have any thoughts or feelings on that, but I really think it's interesting, you know, how during hard times we drive to this, we kind of get down and fight and nationalism and this division, but also it's a great opportunity to say, hey, we need a new global operating system that works for us all. Yeah. I mean, that's another very, very big question. Yeah, it is. It big is. Topic, but uh, yeah, probably... You know, if I if I need to dissect it again, I strongly believe in education. Um, you know, if we that's again, you know, 2020 with the pandemic, with the lockdown, all of a sudden, you know, kids and, and college students and university students have been forced to to learn remotely. And now you have the radar again, the searchlight, what's going well and what's not going well. And in terms of your operating system, I mean, I think one huge major impact education could have you know if if we reinvent education in a way that it feels more connected very naive example i mean i you know i learned english and french at school but from school books and i mean that was the 70s and 80s but it's 2020 why don't kids have a french partner from germany and they learn languages if they learn Spanish, why don't they have a Spanish partner? And if they want to learn Chinese, 
you have a Chinese partner and you get to know this. I mean, imagine yourself if you would have been 12 year old, 13 year old, and you have a Chinese friend. I mean, how cool that would be, um, you know, learning more, because I think the more we know about other cultures and, and, and you know, other people, I think the less, you know, the, the more it feels like, the more insights we have, I think the more it feels like, hey, we're all humans, we're all in this together. I mean, the most exotic probably I've ever done was I, I spent six weeks with, with uh, Native Americans in, in, in uh, like with the Indian tribes in, in the US, you know, with Navajo and, and Sioux. And, you know, for me, that was probably the most exotic because, you know, coming from Germany to spend six weeks among these tribes, amazing, amazing. It changes your perspective. Um, having spent time a little bit in India um, changes your perspective. And now coming back, You know, with education, we don't have to wait until we are mid-20s and we're able to travel and afford it. We can do it already at school. I mean, with the universities, with, with having new, yeah, new type of, of online education. And the other, of course, is like from a politics. I mean, it's so sad to see that elections are won mainly, you know, often, not mainly, but often through populism. <laughs> it's way easier to be very populistic. Like I, you know, because of X, Y, Z, this happens and I promise you the following, but hopefully, you know, with digital, I mean, it becomes more transparent. Hopefully politicians become more accountable. I mean, that's, that's so frustrating because, you know, these days it should be, you know, there should not be alternative facts. A lie is a lie. And, you know, if you have it on recording, if you have facts written out, it's a, it's a fact. We, we need the open press. We need the free press. We need good journalists. We need to have help. We need to hold politicians accountable. And then besides education, if we are able to change politics, that's uh, again, something amazing. And then the third pillar of course is the economy i mean if we experienced one thing over the last whatever 50 years of unbelievable economic growth i mean even this year people tend to forget yes it's traumatic yes companies like lufthansa etc they're down like crazy but at the same time amazon google all the tech stocks i mean if you look it up most of them doubled, you know, like 60% more, 80% more, 100% more since the beginning of this year. So the third pillar has to be around economical developments in there. And you are in a way better position than I to, to talk about the sustainability, the, the SDGs, etc. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear your opinion on that. But from my perspective, I mean, I see some good indications, you know, the shareholder letter from BlackRock um, to yeah. the CEOs, you know, it's not some hippy dippy, um, hey, we should change. I mean, we're talking about a company with over $7 trillion dollar under management. And if the CEO writes a letter to the portfolio and says like, hey, sustainability, climate risk is an investment risk. I know you and I have different uh you know, different back, uh, you, you know, we think differently about it, but it's important that these big money guys see it. Um, it's important to, to, you know, what Microsoft said, like we will pledge 1 billion to, to climate change. And when I read through the press release, the most important thing for me was, and by the way, we will hold our suppliers accountable. So if more of these big companies like Microsoft, SAP, Telecom, whoever, you know, if they say like, you know, we are doing good stuff here and we are forcing our suppliers as well. This could have a, a ripple effect. Again, if we are also from, you know, if we, if we tax differently, I mean, if we say like, you know, and you touched on food, if we say like, look, the end of like these mass production farming, I mean, it's horrible what's, what's happening there. We're going to tax it. it, it it's not possible that people can eat, you know, like a, a kilogram of, of, of meat for five euro. It's not possible. It's not sustainable. It's a, it's a crime against, you know, these animals and to humanity. If you think about the ecological effect, we need to tax it. And if we force these companies to, 
changed because we've seen amazing examples like uh, you know them all better than I do like uh, how's it called the uh, uh, Rügenwalder Mühle or R the Rügenwalder one? Mühle is a great example fabulous example German sausage meat company that made a transition um, 2014 2013 and then really took a, a, a total plant-based move in 2015 and, and 2017 they says yeah we're going to go 100 percent and change the way we produce and just uh, have a couple of good friends that that work there and it's just a fabulous uh, story of, of of some of the things that they've done but it's only it's only one example what yeah. you really just mentioned that you know tesla and amazon and and um uh, microsoft and that there are some companies during this pandemic which uh hit many hard and heavy that actually have tripled and quadrupled their portfolios, their investments, their, their profits, their different things, because they had a different business model. They had a different operating system that uh, allowed social distancing, allowed uh, innovative technologies. They also uh, had some things in plan where um, because of this, they could pivot and deliver essential services, food, uh, Tesla pivoted and did some things with the vaccine production and um, um, uh, respirators and stuff. And very controversial in, in some respects. But if you think about it, you know, the Amazon delivery system, because they had automated and done autonomous chaotic warehousing, they already had social distancing digitization in, into their plan. So the, the robots and the pick and pack system to get the packages, to get it into the box was almost 100% automated. Then it goes to the person who seals the package or makes sure the package is halfway okay. Then it gets put on, on a card and into a truck and one delivery driver with a mask, with gloves, hands it to you or leaves it on your doorstep, but they continued to go and people started to switch to that service. And, that's just one example and probably not the best example how many people, the proofs in the pudding, so to say, that the, they showed and proved that there are better models out there that during a time like this, and we know that there's going to be others that are coming that are just more sustainable, or better, better working models that uh, can, can help you weather storms like this. And so that, that's kind of what I'm sure you do and uh, as well as I do is try to consult our, our clients and our organizations that it's, it, if they haven't, that it's time to start to make those transitions. And even if it's just digital tools in the future of work and how can we make it more efficient and more resilient uh, for what could possibly come in the future. Um, that leads me to my to my most difficult question, and I believe you've answered it many times throughout our conversation. And I, it's it, some some get offended. It's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word. You and I have heard this many times. I want to know from you what your advice or your guidance to companies are, and what your personal vision or maybe predictions of what's the future. Max, what, what's the future? What can we look forward to or maybe some, some direction of a vision? Mm. Ah, what the F, what the future? WTF, question. yeah. WTF. And, and, and because it's 2020 and the pandemic, a lot of people are asking that question that pops into mind. They're, they're saying, what the, you know, but it's actually, what's the future? Oh, totally. I mean, here, Look, one thing I realized is um, it's impossible to predict. And first step is to acknowledge that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. The other day, um, I found this Apple video about the future of health. It was produced in 1998, uh, 88, sorry, in 1988. And it described the future in 2008. You can look it up on YouTube. It's hilarious. The mighty Apple, the coolest company on the planet in 88, how they perceived the future of health. You know what? Amazing things were in there because it's Apple. So, you know, something like a variable like the Apple Watch is in there, FaceTime calls was in there, etc. So amazing creativity. But as you know, it was not available in 2008. 
so one thing I realized is that um, with all our imagination, we can come up with that. We, we rarely are right on the timing. <laughs> and this comes with these exponential developments. I mean, I've been, you know, if I look back, um, I've been often very, very right. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning that that was super early in mobile. As a matter of fact, you know, the first iPhone came ar ar around 2007. I was already doing mobile stuff for seven years. So for seven years, I was rocking around like mobile, 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 you know, it's like the internet in your pocket. You have it always with you. It's 24 seven with you. Look at Japan, what they are doing with iMode. Look at mobile gaming, it will be huge. I mean, I wrote my, my MBA thesis about mobile gaming in the early 2000s and I didn't found a professor who was interested in it because they were like, what do you mean? I can't play on a phone. This is my Nokia phone. What do you mean I will play on a mobile phone? So my point was, you know, I'm not a genius in that. Many of us have seen that coming, but most of us were wrong in the timing. Even 2007 with the iPhone, it was not like that immediately, bam, the world changed. No, it's exponential curve. One, two, four, eight, 16. You had to have the app store. You had to have the bandwidth. You had to have something like Candy Crush and Fortnite and blah, and then it explodes. But in respect of your question, so I'm super careful about answering that. So all I'm, you know, what I think is, is super relevant is number one, be aware that we end up wrong <laughs> about the future. Number two, in order to, you know, be not surprised by the future, and you said it, uh, you know, uh, uh, a few minutes ago, you said something like, we either help to create that future, we either help to shape that future, or it happens to us. And think, I think that's such an important, you know, state of mind, like, hey, I need to actively think about the future and I need to actively create it. Otherwise it will happen to me. Um, thirdly, to start in 2020 and then to project towards 2030, it's almost impossible. I mean, let's take the iPhone as an example because I just mentioned it. We have a pretty good gut feeling what's what will become in a few weeks when the new iPhone 12 will come out. I mean, it will we probably have a better camera, no big surprise. It will have a better processor. It will probably have something, you know, maybe around AR or something, whatever. I can probably give you a good guesstimate about 2021, about iPhone 13. But then, come on, in 10 years, is it a contact lens that I have in my eye? Is it an earpiece? Is it something I stick on my brain? Is it inside my brain? we can only take guesses. And so, you know, for me, the more exciting question is, what do we want as a future? 2030, 2035, um, me as a corporate, as an individual, <laughs> what is this desirable future? And rather start there and thinking like, you know what, I don't know if this will come true, <laughs> but this is actually what I would love to wake up to. This is actually what I want my kids to grow up to. This is what I, what I wish for the world. And then we can re-extrapolate, you know, and, and you know, we were just discussing moonshot thinking and then almost like a slingshot, we can then go back and say like, well, if this is a future for me and I'm, you know, I made the distinction between me personally and the corporates, you can do it as a corporate. If, if, if 2030, if this is the future that I want to wake up to as Volkswagen, as Lufthansa, as whatever, I can work then backwards and say like, oh, okay, then I need to do in 2021 the following. So. I love that. that. That is so fabulous because that's backcasting. That's how, you know, we, we do foresight and, and we do uh, forecasting. But the, the way is, is you find a, a time and a point in time and then you backcast. And then what are the steps, the targets, the indicators or actions that need to be done to come close to reach that? You know, some sometimes we overshoot, sometimes we make it. The other thing you touched upon is this gravitational effect, this gravitational effect, there's a, a formula 
that goes beyond kind of moonshot thinking. It's one that they've used in, in the space shuttles and, and uh, for a long time where we use the gravitational assist of a planet and there's a set formula to use that extra momentum to catapult us, to slingshot us. It's also called the slingshot effect. But there's another one that's very human for us and we've uh, experienced it a couple of times during this pandemic and a couple of times before with the Greta Thunberg movement as well, the Fridays for Future and that, where there's a gravitational pull of humanity, where we pivot, we get, we reach a consciousness, we align ourselves with a vision of, of a future that we want or a future that we realize we're not moving towards. And, uh, and then there's this gravitational pull of humanity to get us there. You, um, have been, I mean, uh, like I did in, the, in, uh, in, in your introduction, innovation, HR transformation, digital nomadism, you know, the automotive industry, health, retail, sports. I, I would like to know from your innovation management or your, your helping companies in, in that direction to prepare them for the future. Do you, this is one thing that I, th that I feel is lacking that we have a lot of dystopian views of what the future looks like, but we don't have a lot of clear, innovative visions or media that show us this desirable future or something that we can innovate and work towards. You and I both come from Star Trek, Star Trek genre, uh, Gene Roddenberry, and most of those all started out with some kind of a book that was then made into a series or into a, uh, into a movie with movie magic and then those visions or images of that media helped inspire us to engineer, create, design, or even do movie magic to kind of push us in that direction to make them into reality, which you've addressed uh, today. How with that, are you helping or can you help or would you say is, is what you'd like to see us get that type of media and help companies get a clear vision of that, that moonshot thinking, that future, or come up with something as it, you just mentioned, that company, how can we get them there? How, how can we have that vision as an organization? Uh, I mean, to, to, before we go to the moonshot and to 2035 or whatever, I mean, clearly in 2020, you have to do certain things. I mean, I think trend scouting has been more important and relevant than ever you know probably 15 years ago 15 years ago it was okay to you know read your tech crunch and <laughs> go once in a while to silicon valley but it's 2020 i mean you have to be so much aware of what's happening in china in in, in asia in tokyo uh, in in japan what's happening in silicon valley what are you know, what are the latest trends? What about the generational changes? I mean, you mentioned Kreta. I mean, Gen Z millennials, you know, to have like a really, really good trend scouting. Why is TikTok exploding? Why is X, Y, Z doing? Why do they behave differently? Um, what kind of patterns do we see? So I think that's something you have to establish. Um, second, as a company, yeah, we need to co-create. We need to be globally connected we need to have our partners the times where you're like oh this is my business model and this is me and everything else is competition i think these days are over i mean i mean you don't have to go you know into co-creation mode with your worst competitor with your major competitor but there is all these similar industries and you can co-create you can create spaces like you know, in Berlin, for instance, Fisman, they opened up this, the, the heating company, they opened up this innovation space in, in Berlin Mitte, actively inviting German Mittelstand family uh, uh, businesses to, hey, join us, you know, let's work together. We need to figure out X, Y, Z, for instance, climate change, what, what impact does that have for us as Fisman? You guys need to do that as well. So why don't you join us on this quest? we need to figure out how Gen Z behaves. You as well, so join us. So, so number two, I strongly believe in co-creation, partnerships, etc. cetera. Um, number three, you, you need to be more agile. You, you know, you call it resilient, agile, etc. cetera. You, you know, 
actively doing something, you know, build, measure, learn, lean startup approach. It can't be that in 2020, it, it takes, you know, a year to spec a strategy and then to have an agency pitch. And then two years later, after spending 2 million euros, you have the results. I mean, that can't be, those days are over. Fast, like rapid prototyping, a design sprint, working with the target group, you know, have, a, you know, not working on assumptions, but on observations on the minimum viable product, using the data. I mean, these, you know, types of like product development has to be inside the DNA, no matter if you're in automotive or in, you know, whatever industry. Um, and fourth, probably around HR, I mean, it's the days where, you know, HR has a super important role. I mean, um, you know, management needs to be on top of things. They need to be, you know, they need to have the space to try out new technologies and new developments. Um, middle management needs to be empowered. Um, but every single employee needs to know about the purpose of a company. I mean, it can't be that when you're working for automotive that the purpose is, yeah, we are building the best cars and i mean come on that's that's the 90s <laughs> so what's the purpose etc so i can go on and on so i think for 2020 there is a bunch of core stuff that someone needs to do like i've mentioned the hr the the innovation management the the trend scouting etc um and then basically in moving forward i strongly believe in these three horizons you know from google the, the incremental stuff, the adjacent stuff and the moonshots. And real quick, the incremental stuff that is often over, overseen and underestimated and often is like, ah, you know, that's, that's the boring stuff. I mean, Google says 70%, seven, zero. Why? Because those types of innovations, they immediately have an effect and they can have a huge effect. You know, those types of little innovations around your core product could be super interesting. It could be around sustainability, like, you know, like how, how do we have a better footprint? How can we reduce waste? How can we do X, Y, Z? And if you come up with a nice idea there, not only is it good for the planet, it might save costs, whatever. Um, if you, you know, reduce on business travel, if you do certain processes better, that's great innovation. You know, I don't want people to think like, yeah, but that's the boring stuff. No, no, no. <laughs> You know, entrepreneurship, if, if you have internally people writing an email saying like, look, I thought about this process. I think we can do it better. It saves us three signatures. It saves us seven minutes, seven minutes times 100,000 times. It's a lot of money well, you know, saved if we do it the old way. The adjacent business is then, you know, the one to three year horizon. I love that as well, because usually it's it's new business models. It's like coming up with these, yeah, like, wait a second, we're doing X, Y, Z. It makes actually sense to go into that direction. So, you know, as a media company um, to go into the influencer marketing stuff, Although it it is um, it it cannibalizes your core business, which might be linear TV advertising or print advertising, but as a media company, it makes so much sense to go into these adjacent stuff like oh yeah, podcasts and influencer marketing, and maybe we should you know license our content to you know foreign countries and new partnerships and etc. Oh, we should move into VR, AR, whatever. That's adjacent. But finally, the moonshots and and in respect of your question, I mean, that's the 10% of your brain power. And those are the most trans that's transformatives. Like what would be our future if people don't drive a car anymore? <laughs> if this future means that people will not consume linear TV or print, I mean, if that's the future, I mean, what does that mean for us? And what is you know, what's, what's actually, what would be something that we feel proud of achieving? And you mentioned all this dystopia and it's absolutely right. I mean, most of the science fiction or, you know, Black Mirror, et cetera, it's dystopian. For me, it's a nice way to create a reaction. Oh no, I don't want that to happen. And it's also a great reaction because then you can ask yourself like, you know, if that Black Mirror 
future, if I would hate it, I mean, what's then the future that I would love to? <laughs> Is it a future without mobile phones? Nah, not really, but maybe with more control. Is it a future without cars? Nah, not really, but maybe with these autonomous and shared and electrified and, you know, where you basically pay for where you pay for the mobility and not for owning a car and stuff like that. So you're really in this mode and, 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 you know, to wrap it up, to have a strong opinion on the future and have in mind that, you know, climate change is real. So it's not like that we have much of a chance that we can just experiment and like, yeah, let's see what 2035 brings us. No, I mean, this future has to be sustainable. It has to be, you know, the Kreta generation. It has to be adopted by Gen Z. And then have a very educated guess, like, okay, this is what I want to grow up to and then work backwards. And like, if, if that means my future as a company or as an individual, I can do that next year, next month, tomorrow, to go at least the first step into that direction. There's three things that I really want to touch upon uh, what you said. So it's really not about the brands of the future. It's about how we produce in the future that will really be not only the biggest benefit for businesses, uh, health and, and our environment and humanity in, in general, uh, it's really how we produce. That, that's, that's, the, that's the real important thing. And the reason I, I, I mention that is you said a couple of things in there. Um, there's a great book from John P. Strelecki. It's called The Big Five for Life. And talks about the big five for life, your purpose for existing. And you mentioned that if we have these intrapreneurships, these entrepreneurs that, uh, you know, say, hey, if we uh, did this, this, these four or five processes in one process, it would save us this much money, this many signatures, this much co-checking supervision. Uh, and it's a better business model. It's a better model to operate on. That's one way we can go. Now, I, I'm, you know, I'm friends with Elon Musk, but I, I, I'm not promoting him. He's very controversial. But there's another fabulous example that I, I want to bring out and maybe get your thoughts or ideas on this that, that I think a lot of people totally miss. Battery Day was actually kind of a flop, you know, in the, especially in the media. It wasn't reported right. Then the stocks uh, dipped. Uh, and I'm like, why don't they get it? I guess they were waiting for a solid state battery. I guess they were waiting from some super um, new brand or product coming out. What he said, and, and let's just get it clear, is that he's turning the gigafactory into a terra factory by the way he produces, the way he increases efficiency, the way he produces or gets raw goods, materials, first principle resources out of the ground that don't hurt anybody. It's just a water and, and a salt uh, type of a, a, of a mixture to get, um, to get things out of the ground and a different way of production that takes you from a gigafactory to a terra factory. And if people can't say by producing in a different way, systems, factories of factories, that there's efficiencies and a ways to reach the future in an exponential way, more efficient way, whatever terminology you wanna use. I, I just couldn't believe that at all, but that's exactly basically what you're, you're saying. That book, The Big Five for Life, actually breaks that down in a couple chapters. It's a real easy read, but it says, you know, how much do you invest in, in your employees to onboard them to hire them and how much will you lose if you fire them or they quit because they're so miserable just pushing the same button every day and they're not reaching the future and it's just like they're robots some monkey could do it or a robot could do that job um, because they're not doing that and how much is lost for the ripple effect on those employees which comes back to how do you uh, create better jobs? How do you be more creative? How do you reach the future? How do you create those models that stay up with our exponentially growing world? And so I love the fact that you touched on all those things and, and you know, you break it down and, 
and, and those pillars uh, is absolutely fabulous. But I believe there's so many examples that we've just seen that are out there that, that gives you the proof of exactly what you said. So I don't know if you have anything to say to that or not. I mean, it's again, many different points, but like with Tesla, absolutely. The, the battery day, I think it just is a nice um, example. You know, if there would have been a new model four or model Z or whatever kind of nomenclature, I mean, people would have, you know, the, the, the news would have been exploded. The, the, the share price would have exploded. I'm, I'm with you. I thought it was amazing because it, it focused more on the long-term sustainable growth of the business. Like, look, if we can do this, if we can pull this off, this is a game changer. So I thought it was exciting, but yes, the media or us, I mean, of course it, it's easier for us to comprehend like, oh, new car looks great. When can I have it? But um yeah, I mean, it's 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 important stuff that you mentioned, starting with the production. I mean, with the limited resources. I mean, I'm to to be honest. Like, I think there is a the, the road is not an easy one. <laughs> but I, not. yeah, but I, you know, I continue to remain a techno optimist. I'm always trying to understand maybe technology could help with that. Um, Yes, more people on the planet, more food is required, but hopefully with these exponential developments that we see in tech, I mean, this is also true for agriculture. I mean, if we can harvest food on a smaller footprint through technology with, you know, in-house farming or however, how do you call it? Vertical farming or controlled environmental agriculture. Yeah, controlled environment agriculture amazing and you know why i stay a techno optimist is if it whatever costs a million today you know is like a hundred thousand in a few years and a fraction of that in 10 years so hopefully we can solve a lot about that um the problem with the meat consumption and i mean i do mean problem because as we all know with these mass production of meat i mean it's just like horrible yeah it's horrible it's an imbalance it's a waste of resources to to get us something and, and it's creating a lot a big ripple effect of other things there's got to be some new ways to do it i'm working with a lot of cellular agriculture foods uh, uh in germany they call it in vitro flesh which is kind of to me sounds like it uh, uh, you know, uh, in vitro babies or something. It doesn't sound that appealing, but it, it's actually a really clean uh, way that uh, doesn't use GMOs and it's not some Frankenstein. It's, it's a, just a better, more, better way to do it. We're running out of time and I have three more questions unless you have something that oh, you good. want to address. There's, um, there's, you know, you're welcome to ask me anything or anything that we left out, throw in. But I wanted you to give my listeners a sustainable takeaway. And so I have three questions to kind of, kind of a give to them a freebie uh, of some wisdom, max wisdom. Um, and the first one is uh, really... the young innovators, the people in your field are kind of moving in the same direction. What should they be thinking about or doing to make a real impact on our future? Yeah, I think um, what we've touched upon this kind of like moonshot thinking, I think that's a very important tool set they should use because way too often we uh, you know we start with the presence and then you know go forward in time no really do it the other way around what's a desirable sustainable future and how can i have an impact and you know i would i would always start with that and then second especially because you said for the younger ones I mean, more bold and brave moves, because I think that's something that really changed these days. Um, you know, we, we have the freedom to ha make bright, uh, a bold and brave moves. I mean, unless we have to fight for our survival, uh, uh, you know, and get the food on the table, but most of us are doing relatively well. And 
you know, these days it's the time where you don't need to have a straight CV and, you know, then I joined McKinsey and then I did this and that, you know, the flexibility of, you know, nano degrees, getting a degree from Google, working abroad, um, working a year there, joining a startup, startup didn't work out. So I joined the corporate, totally okay. After two years, I realized I have an idea, creating your own startup. I mean, so that would be my advice. So think about the desirable future, think about how you can imp, you know, influence that and you know, be more brave and bold about your moves because at the end, it's all little dots that got connected when you look backwards, like Steve yeah. Jobs said. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the next one is, what have you experienced or learned in your own professional journey, this long journey that you would have loved to know from the beginning or from the start? Yeah, it's probably the the last thing I've mentioned. Um, this, you know, all is good. Like, like the, the what Steve Jobs said in this um, inauguration talk. Like, you know, first of all, death is is a really important design element for life. I mean, you know, our friend Gino Yu. I mean, I always laugh when he sees me and I start, you know, with my German, ah, oh, you know, this and that, and then he's always like. You know, the alternative would be you're dead. So how about that? And I'm right. I often so I, I, I have to think about Gino so often when I'm like feeling a bit miserable or whatever. And I'm like, hey, wait a second. The alternative would be death. <laughs> and I'm actually really happy to be alive. So all good. So, you know, I wish earlier on early 20s, mid 20s, I would have had this in mind. And with early 20s, you don't think about death, but I think it should, it's an, it's an important design element. <laughs> and second, um, yeah, all is good. Like these, you know, looking backwards, all these dots made sense and not to, you know, I, I probably wait too often over thought moves like, oh, it, it should be you know, it, this would be great and I should study this and I should do that. No, you know, if it feels right, I mean, it will all turn out uh, <laughs> looking backwards and, and to be a bit more brave because I think, you know, usually we, we fall very soft. I mean, we don't have to fight for food on the table. So, you know, those two years in a startup that didn't turn out okay, it, it's a great experience and you will benefit from that. Um, working abroad, I mean, this is not time wasted. I mean, it's experience that you will take with you for, for the remainder of your career, etc. And having the right priorities, because I mean, you know, at the end, if you die of a heart attack, or if you're completely burned out, I mean, then there is no use. So um, uh, that's also something that I probably at the beginning of my career, because, you know, if you're young, I mean, you're the sky is the limit, <laughs> but to watch out more carefully on these, these indications, like, wait a second, slow down, all good. <laughs> so, Is there anything that you, uh, we left out or that you would like to let my listeners know before I tell you goodbye? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, techno optimism. So, you know, it's so easy to to blame why well, AI will kill us. I mean, it's easy to have such a statement. Um, I think, you know, take the other approach, like, you know, what can an AI do good for me? <laughs> um, exponential developments, oh, we will all run out of jobs because the robots take over. No, I mean, let's think about how robots could support us. So I don't want to call it positivism, but, you know, what I'm forcing myself is before I start complaining to quickly think for a minute, wait a second, maybe we can take a positive twist and we can take a more optimistic approach. This, this and that, it could mean the following, but it also could mean if we do it rightfully. Um, moonshot thinking, because I strongly believe in it um, in order to create the, the future that we want to have, um, we need to have an opinion. And the reason why I've touched on upon it now 10 times is way too often with clients, with friends, you know, we just let it, let it happen to us. 
we don't take the time to to stop to hit the pause button and think about like yeah hey what is it what we want so you know i always will repeat that it's it's an important lesson and yeah and and what you touched upon like be open minded like the global citizenship i mean to to reach out i mean even now with the pandemic i mean one way is to completely go into isolation and to you know you know be grieving about what we all lost in terms of jobs or projects and the other way is like to reach out to friends and like hey how can i be of help how can i support you and you know karma hits back and and you know what's cool i can all of a sudden have a call with robert i know he's so busy in chicago but now because of the lockdown i can have actually a really cool conversation with him and something sparks out of that and i i'm talking to this and to that person and and uh, yeah to see opportunities because like i said with 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 winston churchill you know don't let the good crisis go to waste i mean there are opportunities out of every crisis that, that Peter Diamandis said that as well, the world's uh, biggest problems are also the world's biggest business opportunities or opportunities period. And, and I look at it more of a, a, the, the world's biggest challenge, grand challenges are the biggest opportunities as well. There's always that yin and that yang or that balance. There's, you know, the exponential bad, and then there's exponential good that we can actually hit that balance again. Uh, uh, there's flip sides of every coin. And so I really like that thinking. And I really appreciate your time, Max. It's so good to see you. And I know we'll be seeing much more of each other. We're uh, doing the, the Future IO Moonshot uh, Masterclass uh, is being launched this week. So uh, we're going to see each other around a lot more. And I'm so glad you're on the show. Thanks so much for being here. And uh, uh, I appreciate it. Talk to you later. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> thank you.